Well, good to have all of you log in with us today. Hope everybody's doing well, staying safe and clean. And I uh, hope you're surviving all these uh, restrictions we have to uh, protect us, to keep ourselves uh, separated and therefore not spread uh, this virus. Really hope everybody's doing well. We're going to study beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in just a moment. Let me kind of wrap, tie things up to where we're, uh, bring things to where we're at here. So in Corinth, they're having a big problem with their teachers. They've got a good case of, a, of preacheritis uh, going on. And they're building their faith on the cleverness of speech uh, that these teachers uh, among them are using. And they're using uh, cleverness of speech as opposed to what Paul says, uh, the wisdom of God that comes with power and spirit. Uh, and the wisdom of God, men regard as foolishness, they regard as weak. Uh, the mighty and the noble, the rulers of this age who crucified Christ, had they known it, had they understood it, would not have done so, did not like it. <laughs> Among the Jews, the message of the cross is a stumbling block. The fact that a man would die on a cross and be blessed and bless others was uh, uh, foreign to them, uh, unbelievable. And to the Greeks, they're always seeking after wisdom. They highly regarded sophistry. Uh, the sophist, the philosopher, the wise man among them, uh, these were rock stars. <laughs> they didn't do menial thing, menial labor. Uh, that diminished them. And so Paul is tying in this power of the message of the gospel. And he said, I'm not using the words of uh, cleverness of speech or wisdom of men because I don't want to make the cross of Christ of none effect. <laughs> And so he then says, but we didn't get this because we sat down and studied books for 29 years. Uh, we didn't get it because of something we saw, because of something we, we heard, or something that we felt. Uh, what we received, we received from uh, the Holy Spirit who revealed the mind of God to us. And uh, just, just like we can't know what each other's thinking unless we we speak and we tell what's on our mind. Uh, you can't know what someone's intends by just simply looking at them. Body language doesn't reveal the whole thing. Facial expressions don't tell tell the whole story. And so you have to speak up. You have to have to speak your mind so people understand what it is. Well, God's spirit has spoken his mind and revealed it to the apostles. And they spoke about spiritual things with spiritual words. And all this was so that man wouldn't have the glory. This didn't appeal to the mighty and the noble and to the wise. Uh, God shaped it like this so man would have no glory in this. Uh, you look at the history of what man has considered foolish. And you see the strength of God's wisdom. Uh, like the marching around the walls or the healing of Naaman by dipping seven times in, in a river. You see the simplicity of the gospel that men call foolish. But it takes a spiritual mind to be able to appreciate spiritual things and spiritual words. And the one who calls the gospel foolish is a natural man, and he doesn't regard spiritual things that way. And so then we come the first part of chapter three, and he said the demonstration of all this is that you're fussing and fighting with one another. The fact that you're filled with carnality that is seen by the envy and the strife, the, divi the uh, divisiveness that's uh, among you. Uh, I, I want to take you to a deeper spiritual level, but uh, I wasn't able to take you there because you're just not ready for it. You're not spiritually minded enough to be able to grasp the depth of these spiritual truths that I'm trying to reveal to you. And before we can go any further, he says, we got to take care of this divisiveness over your teachers. Uh, you're putting me and Paul, me and Apollos and Cephas in competition with one another. And we're not in competition with each other. And the fact that you're elevating your teachers over the message of the cross is making the message of the cross of none effect. When all we are uh, is we're just instruments of God through whom you believed. We're just instruments to whom the gospel was revealed. 
I'd like to pause just a moment and say something about that. I think it's important to, to, to realize that preachers aren't in competition with one another. And preachers should not be in competition with one another. And brethren shouldn't put them in competition with one another. I'm not diminishing the fact, nor is Paul diminishing the fact, that you can't appreciate the one who brought you the gospel. We have those we appreciate and that we love. And some we esteem because of their influence in our life greater than, than others, but it's because they're the instruments to whom the gospel came. It's not because we elevate our teachers to be gods. And when we elevate our teachers to be gods, then no longer are they the instrument to whom the gospel has come that have caused us to believe, now they, they become the point. And so I think it's really important that we recognize that we hide behind the cross, and it's the cross that's the point, not, not the man. And they were imag- uh, evaluating man on his stature, his size, on his speaking ability, on his, his wisdom, on the way that he, he, he would turn a phrase, on, on what, how, how, he, how, he would say, how he would say things. Uh, They evaluated man based on his, his stature, his sight, his speech, the way he sounded, and by their personal experience, by who baptized them. And Paul said, those who think themselves most spiritual because of their inner light and mystic feeling yet reject what is revealed are actually, you're, you're, the, you're the natural man. You're not the spiritually minded man. And so Paul writes this letter trying to call, call, them, call their attention the proper place of their teachers and how they're not really putting the gospel in its proper proper place. So he comes down then to verse 5 where we begin today and begins to draw this out a little bit more. And he's going to use three word pictures uh, that can easily be seen. And first of all, he talks about the role of, uh, of the teachers as being uh, those who sow in water. He said, verse 5, who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers to whom you believe? And the Lord gave each one. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Notice throughout this whole section that we're going to see, it's God, 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 God. God gave the increase. God gave the increase. God gave the increase. Paul says, we're sowers. We plant. We water. We fertilize. We prune. And we harvest. Souls for God. Uh, we're just servants to whom you believe. We're not God's with the Corinthians we're making them out to be. We're simply partners. We're working together. We're not competing to out-green each other's thumb, to outgrow each other's crop. Uh, In verse 7, in the latter part, he says, but God is the one that gives the increase. And so he says, we're simply fellow workers. Uh, We're we're fellow workers laboring uh, together uh, in the gospel. It makes no difference who the instrument is. All success is traced back to God. The fact one teacher instructed and is a little more eloquent than the other doesn't matter. Uh, there's one that, that sows and plants. There's another that waters. There's another that reaps, reaps the increase. But God's the one, or, or, or reaps the harvest, but God's the one that gives the increase. Uh, Paul certainly could have boasted of his attainments over Apollos. But the thing that was important was to draw eyes away from men and fix our eyes on the true true source. Uh, it's God who gives the increase. Because he who plants and waters, they're one. They're one with regard to their purpose. They're one with regard to the end of the labor that they, they are, they're trying to, to produce. And so both are laborers for God. Paul and Apollos are one as to aim, service, and purpose. Uh, and so he's encouraging them to end this rivalry among the Paul party, Cephas party, Apollos party. And then he says in the last part of, uh, of verse 9, uh, or uh, verse 8, he said, Now he who plants and waters are one, each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. While their design is one, uh, they'll be judged based on individual labor. Uh, they're working for God in God's field, and he says it's a serious matter that one labors for God. And so that leads into the next imagery, 
Uh, so you have the sowing that's there. The next imagery is one of building. And you see that in verses 10 uh, down through verse uh, 17. So here's a second figure, uh, one of building. And it illustrates uh, different kinds of labors in, in this particular uh, section uh, that he's talking about. So he says, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given to me a wise master builder. I've laid the foundation, another builds on it, but each one take height, heed how he builds. And so uh, you have, have, have the soil. Uh, he says, how does your garden grow to the Corinthians? He said, you have a lot of crabgrass there. You got a lot of bitter weeds. You got a lot of weeping willows out of there. But his goal is to produce a field that's producing uh, healthy, healthy crops. So he says, you need to grow. You need to transplant the refreshing fruit of the Spirit where rottenness full of pride is at. Then he talks about the, the, the laboring that takes place as the, wise, as the wise master builder. And so the idea of a master builder, the idea of master builder is the idea of an architect. Uh, he tells the architectural layout, how it was drawn up. You might say Paul was kind of the, the foreman of the job. Uh, you have the workmen that work under the direction of the architect. Uh, and Paul says, uh, verse 10, as a wise, according to the grace of God given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid by Jesus Christ. So Paul says, Here I come preaching the gospel to you. I, I'm, I'm laying it out. Uh, uh, and he doesn't mean that he's a chief architect over everybody else, over the builders. But he said, I laid the foundation for you. Uh, I was responsible for laying the foundation. So the structure uh, would, be, would be sound. Uh, and so the foundation determines to a great extent the nature of the building. And so he said, I was the architect, not, not the chief architect, but I was the architect that laid the foundation. And when I laid the foundation, others came and they built upon it. In other words, you had the, the one that lays the foundation, one that builds all, all the same thing, all this together. Why? Because no other foundation can anyone lay, which is Christ. He said, when this is understood, all the work comes into proper focus. But for quarreling over who laid the foundation, uh, we'll never build properly. As a wise master builder, Paul had established the hearts of the Corinthians on the one and only foundation, Jesus Christ. All he taught and preached was to this one end. What he had begun, others then continued. Again, he began it. Now who's continuing it? Apollos. Uh, Timothy will spend time there. Titus will spend time there. And so Paul laid this out. He said, look, we're not in competition. We're, we're, we're all builders together uh, in this. We're all working for the same, same purpose, same goal. But then he says in verse, verse 12, now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear for the day. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work. If anyone's, anyone's work which he has built on endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved as through the fire. That's a challenging set of uh, verses to try to lay out. So let's walk through them. He said, again, I laid the foundation. That's where that's where all the work began. Uh, all the foundation is laid. Now the erection of the building can take place. But he said, when you take heed, where you have this pseudo wisdom is admired, you have the wisdom of these teachers that's admired. There's a danger the servants will be sought who will cater to the, uh, their dangerous appetite for, for pride. Instead, the building will be imperishable. Uh, instead of building with the imperishable, per, imperishable truth, you'll build material that, that will uh, forsake or be, be not true to the, to the foundation. But notice that Paul's focus is on the quality of the building. Uh, because of the excellence of the foundation, he urges them to use only the best materials, long-lasting like gold, silver, and precious stones, rather than temporal things that are flammable like wood, hay, and straw. Uh, the first three, uh, gold, silver, and precious stones, were found in fireproof uh, temples, uh, material worthy of uh, sacred structures. The latter three were used in, in frail, combustible huts, which were in no way dedicated to, to any god. 
The argument is that the Corinthian uh, current uh, Christians should build the spiritual temple of God, the church, as with good spiritual material, as the relative earthly material employed by their fathers or the relatively er earthly material employed by their teachers. And so he gives these six different materials, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble, uh, to, to think about how this building is, uh, is taking place. But then in verses 14 and 15, he says, if anyone's work which is built on endurance, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss. He'll be saved. So you have the, you have the inspection. Uh, Paul explains why it's so important to build this high-quality control of building materials because every believer's work will be inspected. Uh, the purpose of the inspection is to decide whose work has, uh, it's not to decide whose work has earned salvation because that can't happen. Uh, so not the man that's under evaluation here, but the material he works with is under evaluation. Uh, he can't select it. Uh, one said, Paul had just told the church that they were God's building. And then the kind of building is stated as the temple of God. The building has a foundation. In preaching Christ to the Corinthians, Paul had laid the foundation it's the foundation on which the material is to be built. Therefore, the foundation, which is Christ, is the foundation is to be built on. That's mentioned when he talks about in, in verse 12, anyone who builds on this foundation. Others are making converts in the city of Christ. We're building on the foundation laid by Paul. And some of these additions to the church would be gold, silver, precious stone. Others would hay and stubble. So the worthiness of the temple, uh, the worthiness of the material uh, built in the local church will be burned up. And so Paul says, take heed. So once again, you don't necessarily pick who's gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. So he's talking about the material. You're not necessarily talking about the man himself. And so when you look at materials tested by fire, uh, the Lord is going to allow people to go through fires to find out what kind of people they are. The severe persecution is going to test them. Uh, some may be overzealous. Uh, some may, may reap a harvest before it's ripe. Uh, some are likely to build material in the church that's comparable to wood. They can't stand the persecution. Uh, such men are going to suffer loss. So here's a man that invests himself in teaching people. And as he invests himself in teaching people, the reward that he gets is to see, see them survive. So he talks about these precious, precious stones versus wood, hay, and stubble. You have those who, who you teach, and they, they endure uh, the challenges of life. They go through the difficulties of life. They, they stand strong in the difficulties of life. They, they, they overcome. They become victorious. And then you have the material that he spends his life laboring with, and they're not able to stand. Uh, they burn up. They burn up in the process of things. Well, it's not the man that's the teacher that then burns up, but watch his reward. He's put everything he's got into, into that and now then suffers loss. He did his work, continues to do his work. It doesn't mean he's lost, but watch his work. Uh, you can see the kind of discouraging thing that's taking place uh, with Paul here. So here you have some of the Corinthians that ought to be strong, but... They're not. They're still carnally minded. He's trying to get them to a place where they'll be able to stand the test. And he'll reap a, he will reap a reward of joy when they do. But for those who, who are challenged and fall away, uh, basically it breaks his heart. Uh, it's, it's a loss to him. Uh, and so the church is made up of converts. Uh, it's going to be made up of those who will withstand. It's going to be made up of those who with whom fire will consume. And uh, it's difficult. Uh, the teacher's not responsible for the convert's heart. But I tell you, it, it plays on the teacher when the one you spend time converting is burned up like wood, hay, and stubble are. You spend all your time and your, your energy invested in trying to teach this person, and then some trial of life comes, and it blows them away, it destroys them. A marriage falls apart, financial reversals, COVID-19 uh, comes. Uh, drastic measures are taken to uh, segregate people so there's social distancing. 
so these disease won't 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 spread. Uh, so here's a very relevant thing to it for us, folks. Uh, are we all going to be precious stones? Are we going to be the kind of stones that will withstand the fire? Are we going to be the kind of stones that though we were restricted as to how we can come together, that we're going to stay strong and that we're going to be able to endure? Uh, the difference is not the one that converted you. The difference is not Apollos or Paul. Uh, Apollos and Paul, they, they planted, they watered, they laid the foundation, they built. Again, Paul has laid the foundation here and Apollos comes in afterwards. Uh, I pray to God that we, we all will be those precious stones and that we'll have none that are wood, hay, and stubble. I pray to God that not a, first of all, a soul will be sick because of this virus, but then sick, second, not, not a soul who because of this virus will be lost because we're not unable to do what is our regular routine. Uh, nobody likes this. It's certainly not a great deal of a personal touch to be able to speak through an impersonal screen to you, but I hope there's some value. So I think what Paul is saying here has some real value to us. Uh, we need to make sure that we're the kind of material that endures. But when you're teaching people, you just don't know. You just don't know the kind of material is until the test comes. And the fact is the test is going to come. It's going to come for all of us. Uh, Will our building be inspected by eyes that can see into every service, every cluttered closet, every storeroom stuffed with straw? Uh, don't take shortcuts. Uh, we got to follow uh, God's blueprint, build our life on his foundation. And so I think it's very relevant to us. We make sure we're building on God's foundation, following God's blueprint. You know, sometimes the question is asked, or I hear the criticism made, well, you're just just too narrow. You're you're just you're just too conservative in things. Well, if if we're deriving what we do from the wisdom of God, that is His revelation, then we're as conservative as we conservative conservative as we need to be, and we are as liberal as we can be. We're liberal where He is liberal, and we're conservative where He is conservative. I talked last time about the wisdom of men the cleverness of speech. And I refer to the, to the religious world. If the religious world doesn't recognize the blueprint, blueprint that God uses to build, but adds their own, their own design to the building. It impacts those who are trying to follow the plan and the blueprint. Those who are following the blueprint are often criticized for not being the ones who are liberal and generous. No apology for being stingy, for being selfish. But we need to make sure we're building on the building on the right foundation, the wisdom of God, Christ Jesus himself, and that we're following God's plan. And when we follow God's plan, we'll have a building that will be that will endure the, the trials that come. And then he comes to the third image <laughs> that he uses to describe the Corinthians. They're more than just a field. They're more than just a building. Here he shows the high value God places on the purity of the local church because he calls them a temple. Uh, so he's building on a common metaphor taken from the magnificent temples uh, in Corinth, just like he talked about the mysteries playing on the environment at Corinth. Now he's using the word temple that plays on the magnificent temples and public buildings that were in Antioch, Athens, Corinth, and Ephesus. And they had those magnificent buildings. Here you have the, the goddess Aphrodite that we talked about in the introduction. This great temple that sat on top of a Aquacorinthius, this great hill that was there, this great massive temple. And so Paul's pulling that imagery up. So he then says, verse 16 and 17, Do you not know that your temple, you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God if anyone defiles, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. The temple of God is holy, uh, which temple you are. So now he simply puts these facts. Uh, he tells the Corinthians, they are the temple of God. They are God's shrine. 
and the Holy Spirit dwells in them. Uh, and so he's warning them and says, if anyone defiles the temple, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. The church is being threatened. Uh, it's being threatened by their partyism. And it's going to be threatened by their immorality we're going to look at. So here's a warning uh, added to the needed protection that is there. Uh, he said, you don't want to destroy this. This is God's temple. As a church and as individuals, we're to be walking, breathing temples of his holiness. And so he warns, uh, as again, verse 17, if anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. Whoever destroys the temple of God in this case, that is, whoever destroys this group of people. Here you have these Corinthians, and here you have this envy and strife that's taking place because of their carnality. Here you have this party spirit over their teachers. Here you have these teachers that are coming in. They're not building. They're not the planters. They're not the waterers. They lay the foundation. They're not the master builder. They're not building according to the foundation. If they come in and they destroy the temple of God, if they desecrate the temple of God, they desecrate this group of people, he said God will destroy them. You Corinthians are God's holy temple. And whoever destroys his temple, uh, God will destroy them. He said, you are to be clean. Uh, you are holy of character. You're of a different class of character. Uh, it's not you who ought to uh, be the one. Just don't, don't destroy yourself. Don't devour yourself. So the question is, how much time and energy do we put into cleaning up our lives? What is our passion for purifying our hearts to every fraction of an ounce of sin's poison? Uh, and so we need to make sure we're a mature plant. We need to make sure we are a quality building. And we need to make sure that we are a pure temple. And so here the Corinthians lived with upturned nose, uh, breathing only esoteric air of their own intelligence. That is rare air of their own intelligence. And Paul tells them how to be truly wise by trusting in the foolishness of God or of God's wisdom. And then he says, verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul, Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, all things present to come are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. And basically, he's reiterating things that he's already said here. Uh, he talks about uh, God catching you in your own craftiness. He talks about becoming a fool for Christ. Don't be wrapped up in the wisdom of this age. Don't let it overcome, because look, we're all yours. Paul, Cephas, Apollos, uh, don't use as, as instruments to divide. We're all yours. And so he says, you take heed to yourself. You be careful. Uh, you stay humble about this. And don't you get li lifted up in your own pride uh, about what's taking place here and what's going on in, in, in the world here. Uh, he says, you, you, you become the fool for Christ. Uh, you walk, walk with Christ. You, you walk with him. Uh, don't let anyone deceive you. That is, don't let anyone give you a false impression. Uh, Paul gives God's appraisal of, of that kind of wisdom uh, and says God will catch them in their own craftiness. The Lord's not impressed with Christians who live only to develop their minds. He wants us to develop genuine, genuine humility. And so he takes us back again to, to the call of the cross. And so that brings us to the end of chapter 3 that Paul is talking about here, trying to get these Corinthians all on the same page. Again, I think the book has real value to us today. Uh, it has real value to us to show us the importance of who we are as teachers. It has real value to us today to show us the kind of material that will endure. It has real value to show us that we bear responsibility for God's temple. And we dare not destroy God's temple and certainly dare not destroy God's temple over our teachers. Well, hope you continue to have a good day and hope you continue to, uh, to be healthy. Thanks for uh, logging in.